thanks a lot for the opportunity of being here today. My name is Carlos Martinez. I'm a PhD student in the labs of Dr. Anani and Dr. Kersi Garas. And today, the title of my presentation is Embracing Bacteriophages for Poultry Food Safety. Now, I'm going to start by, with this uh, presentation by introducing the bacteria of interest. This is Salmonella. It's a rod-shaped, non-spore-forming bacteria, and it's a gram-negative. Now, in this project, we are focusing specifically in Salmonella enterica, subspecies enterica, and more specifically in those non-typhoidal serovars. Now, this bacteria is responsible for a large number of infections every year, cause, causing illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. Now, this is a foodborne pathogen, and the main vehicle of these infections is the consumption of contaminated food products. Now, the one among these products, the one with the highest incidence, is poultry. According to the USDA and the CDC, 19% and 16% of illness and outbreaks are attributed to the consumption of contaminated poultry products. Now, how this contamination happens, uh, this bacteria can be introduced to the a production chain very early in farms, for example, by different environmental factors, as you can see here in this diagram. And this causes what we call an asymptomatic colonization. Now, these colonized birds can easily transmit this to the rest of the flock, and they, they become the number one source of contamination later on in production. Now, these colonized birds are transferred to the processing facilities, and these colonized birds can consistently shed this bacterium throughout the whole production or the whole processing uh, steps, starting from scalding all the way to packaging. Now, there's contamination here and the industry is applying different antimicrobial interventions to prevent this contamination. Although based on the numbers, we know that there are, qu there are questions that are being raised about the efficacy of these interventions. Therefore, now there's a constant look for new decontamination technologies that can be either coupled to the ones that we have right now or replaced uh, probably in the future. And the strategy that we want to use is the implementation of bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, or phages for short, are the most abundant biological entity in the planet and with approximately 10 to the 31 particles. They are very, very diverse according to the International Committee of Taxonomy of Viruses. They can be classified in a large number of families, subfamilies, genera, and species. Now, the family that is the most common or abundant are tail phages, or phages that belong to the Caudobiralis family, with approximately 96%. And these phages are characterized by having a tail, as you can see here in the figure, and a double-stranded DNA. Now, Phages can replicate via two different cycles. For example, we have the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle, but we're going to be focusing on the lytic cycle or lytic phages that replicate via this cycle because it's the one that leads to bacterial lysis or killing of the bacteria, which is what we want. Now, you're probably wondering why phages or applying these viruses is an alternative for biocontrol. Well, the application of these viruses or phages directly on food products has demonstrated to not affect the organolectic properties of the food product. They can also encode for biofilm dispersal enzymes, and they are considered a natural and a very, very environmental, environmentally friendly approach. Now, their application has been estimated at around one to four cents per pound of product, more specifically in chicken, two cents per chicken carcass. This is comparable. Uh, there's a huge gap comparing these to other technologies such as high pressure processing. Now, the rationale of our project is that uh, we know that poultry products are contaminated with salmonella. So applying these chemical or physical treatments, is pretty, it's pretty harsh and it, it changes the quality of the product. So by applying phages that are natural and we can reduce these levels of contamination and also prevent the contamination during processing. It's something that can happen as well is that bacteria can develop resistance to the infection of the phage where we can study this bacteria because it has been related to a decreased virulence. And also by studying back the bacteria and the phages that infect this bacteria, we can learn more about the phage host interactions and this can help us to build better cocktail or, or better approaches to apply phages in the future. So we're planning to use either free phages encapsulated phages or immobilized phages, these two steps that we consider critical for contamination or cross-contamination and growth. And 
this brings me to the next step, which is the uh, the main challenges in phage biocontrol. So as I mentioned, bacteria can develop resistance to the phage by different uh, mechanisms. And we call this a bacteriophage insensitive mutant. And also phages can be inactivated due to different environmental conditions in process and facilities. And also there's limited knowledge about the phage host interaction and how bacteria can develop resistance to the phage. Now we can overcome these challenges by first of all, designing a rational phage cocktail, and I'm gonna talk about this later. Also, protecting we can protect the phages from harsh conditions by encapsulating or immobilizing them. And we can study the impact of the, of the development of resistance in bacteria. So these are the three, three main components of this project, but uh, today I'm gonna be focusing on the first one, which is the rational design of a phage cocktail. Now, I must say that isolating phages against salmonella is a relatively simple task. Isolating the right bacteriophage is not. We screened approximately 60 different samples and we isolated a large number of bacteriophages against salmonella, specifically around 40, around, specifically 40 phages. And we did different methods to screen and select the most suitable phages. And our number one criteria is to isolate phages with a broad lytic spectrum, phages with broad host range. This is because Salmonella enterica has a more than 1,600 different zero bars, and these zero bars are often associated with outbreaks in poultry and also other food products. So we need a phage cocktail that can target multiple zero bars in order to prevent these outbreaks. So that's our first criteria right here. So we developed this assay to, <clears throat> to uh, determine the host range or to study the host range of our phages in a high throughput manner where we can study uh, 22 different salmonella zero bars against four different phages in a single experiment. And we can monitor the growth over 24 hours at 25 degrees when we, when we infect this bacterial culture with a low concentration of phage. And we designate different letters depending on the inhibition that this phage has against that bacteria, that bacterium. And we designate, for example, a C when there's a complete inhibition throughout the whole experiment, the bacteria never reaching this detection threshold, or we de designate a D plus or a D if there was only, or there was a delay to reach this uh, de detection uh, threshold. So in this table, it's, it's, here's the summary of all the phages that we isolated. On the columns, we have all the salmonella zero bars. On the rows, we have the phages. And I know there's plenty of information in this table, but for example, I want you to see the lower part of the table where we isolated phages with very narrow host range, only capable of infecting one out of the 22 salmonella zero bars that we tested. On the top, there are those phages that we wanted, those phages with broad host range. And we took these phages and we took them to the next step, which is selecting the receptor or the ideal receptor. This is because, as I mentioned before, bacteriophage resistance is one of the main challenges in phage biocontrol. And bacteria can block the infection in any single one of these, uh, of these, of these uh, steps in the lytic cycle. And we decided to tackle one of these mechanisms. So we went into a literature and we found that the most prevalent and most well-studied resistance mechanism is the adsorption blocking. So we decided to tackle this mechanism using a very simple yet very efficient approach, which is selecting phages targeting multiple receptors. So we found that in all the phages that we isolated, we found the receptors for the phages with broad host range, as you can see here. And we also, uh, addition to, additionally to this, we isolated this phage that is capable of infecting broad bacteria or bacteria that has lost the O antigen. So based on these results, we selected this phage cocktail of five different phages and their, their respective micrographs is over here, as you can see. And in total, we are targeting four different receptors, which is very, very interesting. And we haven't seen this in, in the literature before. So we put together this phage cocktail. We uh, uh, tested their, its efficacy against 22 different salmonella zero bars. And here are the results. So we did the same experiment that I showed you before, we monitored the growth for 24 hours. And we, and when we infected with different concentrations of the phage, phage cocktail, and here are the results. And as you can see, even when we have very low um, concentration of the phage, phage cocktail, 
we have great inhibition and great coverage for most of these salmonella cirrovars. And as we increase this concentration, there's better inhibition, which is what we will expect, more concentration of phages, more inhibition. And even at moderate concentration, we have great inhibition, which is actually what we were, we were looking for. And these results are very, very promising. The next step is to study the development of resistance. And we use Salmonella enteritidis to study this. We study beam frequency and growth inhibition and also the susceptibility of these beams. And in this slide here, I'm summarizing a lot of work, but uh, we quantified the frequency of emergence of resistance in either a single phage or the cocktailed phages. And as you can see here, what we expected is that there's a significantly lower beam frequency in the phage cocktail compared to single phage. On the right panel, we have a similar experiment to what we did before. In this case, it's a, a low MOI of five, but in this, in this case, we incubated for an extended period, period of time of 72 hours in 10 biological replicates. So here, the red square indicates that there was no regrowth uh, uh, observed after 72 hours and the green squares indicate that there was regrowth at this specific time indicated in the squares. But overall, we can see that the phage cocktail inhibited the growth of this specific zero bar for up to 72 hours in most of the cases on the most of the biological replicates that we tested. Now, another uh, challenge that I mentioned before is that phages can be inactivated by different environmental conditions. So we studied the for example, temperature stability of our phages, and so we found that all the phages were, were stable at temperatures up to 60 degrees, and some of them were, like all of them were inactivated at higher temperatures as we expected. But this is interesting because it opens up the possibility of applying these phages in other steps in processing late, later on. Now, we also studied the stability of the phages in a wide range of pHs, and we found that all the phages were stable at, at even across all the pHs and even at low and high pHs such as three, in some cases pH of 12, which, which was very interesting to see. We also studied the phage genomes. We found uh, uh, variability in the size of the genomes. We found different coding sequences and even tRNAs in some cases. And we screened for different virulence factors or antimicrobial resistance genes. And we didn't, found, we didn't find any of these genes in our phages. And we also studied the phage infection kinetics where we calculated or estimated the latent period and the birth size of every single one of the phages that we included in the cocktail. Now we have completed the first step in our project. Now then we're going to be studying the immobilized phages and the impact in the development of resistance. And that's it uh, for me uh, today. And I want to thank, thank all the my colleagues in the Kersey Garrel Lab and in Anani's lab and also to our funding agencies and also thank you for your time and thank you very much. Bonjour Carlos, congratulations for your presentation. It's very interesting. We have a question regarding the potential zoonotic capability of your bacteriophages. Can you uh, elaborate on this topic? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, well, phages are known to all insect bacteria and they're very safe for humans. And, and if we think about it from the context of like applying phages directly on food, even we, we have taken samples like from retail chicken and we have isolated phages from those samples. The phages are already present like pretty much everywhere and they're pretty safe. And, and in this case, um, we expect these, these phages not to be the, the exception. Okay. I have another question, which has to do with the temperature at which you tested your bacteriophages. You mentioned that uh, you were testing them uh, starting at 30 degrees up to 80. The chilling tank temperature is, however, lower. Did you test them and their efficacy uh, at uh, a low temperature as well? Yeah, that is a good question. Actually, phages are very, very, very stable at low, low temperatures. That's the uh, preferred storage temperature for phages. We actually did a shelf stability test where we uh, stored the phages like at room temperature, four degrees and minus 20. And the ideal temperature in this case was four degrees where the phages were stable for up to a month, where there was no reduction at all in the phage titer. And we also have another experiment where we test the efficacy of the phage to inhibit the growth of salmonella. But in, in this case, we use 
what we call the abusive temperature, and we use 15 degrees. And the phages are very, very efficient in controlling the, the growth in, in those conditions. We didn't use lower temperatures because salmonella doesn't grow very well at like four degrees. We will have to be incubated for a, lo a lo very, very long time. But at least at the abusive temperature of 15 degrees, they are very, very efficient. Okay, good. Um, another question, what will be your final use, internal use or on surface? Yeah, great question as well. Uh, the, the final goal is to apply the phages directly on the, on the product that will be in the surface, either in the free phages or encapsulated or even uh, impregnate the, the packaging material with phages so we can prevent the growth in, in the shelf, uh, the, the growth of salmonella in the shelf. Thank you.